We even had somebody uh, get through the entire first zone in what, like four hours? Got through it, killed the final boss, did it with like the lowest level equipment possible because basically just skipped most things and but didn't really my, craft anything. Here's my favorite <laughs> feedback about that though, because he was like, seemed like the boss had a lot more health than they should. It was too hard, basically. It was And I was like, you're like a naked person hitting them with a rock. <laughs> yeah. Scotch. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 444 of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast of Butterscotch shenanigans. I'm Seth, and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam, and I'm the miscellaneous programmer. And I'm Sam, and I'm distractible. And this is a show where we talk about life business and working in the games industry. Today is December 1th, 20 Jubilee. Before we get started, we have a warning. There's going to be profanity in this show. There's going to be curses, swears, hexes, spells. Mm -hmm. So buckle your pants. I didn't even realize it was December until you just said that. It has become December. To be fair, it's like only been like, December briefly. So yeah. yeah, just barely. Still though, I just had no idea. Mm. Yeah, we're at, we're at a fresh newborn December. What will it grow up to be? Mm. No one knows. Will it be a good December or will it be an absolute piece of crap? Mm. I think we'll both, or probably. something in between. Maybe yeah. it's hard to say. Uh, we also like to thank our recurring supporters over at MoneyGrab.bscotch.net. Thank you so much for your. Monthly donations to help keep this podcast going. All right, now here's the deal, you guys. We haven't recorded an episode in like three weeks. We stockpiled several episodes because it has been sort of bonkers over here. Uh, Sam has been sick the for whole time. the and whole still time. Is. And still is. With Hard RSV, mm-hmm. right? Or something like, yep. yeah, some kind of... It's probably a couple which things I guess, in a row or something, but... Yeah, one of them's brutal. Yeah, I'm getting vibes from Sam that are similar to what happened to me in December of 2019, mm-hmm. where I was sick for six weeks. It's just sort of like cycling through symptoms and stuff. Yeah, might have been best. COVID, but, you know, that might, have might been not mixed have been. in there at that point. Who knows? Yeah, probably also had COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so Sam, you know, he's he's, uh, he's working through it. He's working through some stuff. Yep. Uh, we had, so I... Let's see. We had Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. so we had our break. Uh, I went to North Carolina mm-hmm. over that. Uh, Sampy, my wife, went to India around that time. Uh, we did our play test of Crashlands Two, which is the big thing we want to we want to talk about today. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff happened as well. It's been it's been a time. T- it's been a time. Uh, so let's we let's also, just get into uh, we it. also. D- Vetted and hired two more contractors to help out with some stuff in the studio. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That was another yeah. that was another thing that happened the past four weeks. Yep. We did. Yeah. So very excited about that. Uh, for on, on my end, I'm working with uh, Tabular Elf, who is who is now in charge of the Discord server of the Game Maker Kitchen. He just got handed the mantle by Juju Adams. Uh, he's a, a pretty prolific uh, Game Maker programmer who's got all kinds of, you know, crazy GitHub projects and whatever. And so... Um, he's, he's coming in to do some cleanup and optimization for some of our, our, uh, UI systems in Crashlands 2, which is, you know, it's, it's always kind of a weird experience for me to kind of like bring in another programmer and have them poke you know, stuff like, you made, poke, poke stuff on my code. Cause like, I'm just, I'm so unaccustomed to it. I, I like it and I like having that, like the extra pair of eyes and it kind of forces me to think differently about how I'm writing my code. Cause you know, it needs to be more clear, right? Like it's always a good thing, but uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting mm-hmm. it's an interesting uh, exercise, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's doing he's doing great work. And then Sam, you uh, brought in an artist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been first so, time working with a art contractor, so should be a lot of fun. I'm very excited. Yeah, she hasn't started good. yet though. So mm-hmm. we'll- hasn't started yet. Um, but yeah, that, so the goal there is to kind of uh, uh, kind of backfill a bunch of a bunch of content from the first act of of Crash Dance Two, while Sam kind of forges ahead on some of the more uh, technical stuff and, and sort of foundational stuff, stuff yeah. uh, in the uh, in the next chunk of the game. So, which is all uh, to say that the first act of the game is done, you know, mm-hmm. with some More. asterisks after it, but mm-hmm. it's done. Which is why we also done had our play test. <laughs> yeah, done. Yeah, done. TM. Uh, okay, so that, was, so that was why we, it was time to do our play test as part of this, like wrapping up this milestone, was to kind of answer these final questions of just you know we've done little one-off play tests here and there over time. Of course, we've all been playing the game. Uh, but we needed to make sure that before we set off and did the next two acts, um, 
that that we had a good foundation. Yeah, that we had a good foundation. On. There weren't any surprises, and and that and that on the more positive side, that we knew what people were into about the stuff that was in the game, so we could make sure that that stuff we didn't accidentally leave floundering because we didn't realize how key it was. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, we want to know what people aren't into so we can figure out how to, you know, where where appropriate, how to mitigate those yeah. issues people have or, you know, or or in some cases, if people have, if, if they're like people are universally kind of having a bad time with some aspect of the game, uh, which did happen yeah. mm-hmm. with, with uh, fishing. Yep. Fishing, which we'll, which we'll talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fishing, controller yeah. support and character speed were the kind of the three recurring yeah. things. Yeah. Which is kind of like a... Uh, and it's like, well, these are kind of like fundamental things. And it, like people's issue wasn't that they existed. It was just the balance of them, which, you know, which we'll get into. Um, yeah. So first let's talk about uh, sort of like why we did this play test and how how we went about it. So what was our goal and how did we uh, select the the testers? Like what was our approach there? Yeah. I mean, on a, on a really high level, when you're looking at doing a play test, the reality is that they're, they're very expensive to do. And I mean that in the sense of just... Time and raw, resource. Yeah, raw time in preparation, in running, and then in post, uh, as well as, of course, you're then also bringing in people to play. So it's uh, just from a sheer like time perspective, we don't like doing it in any kind of haphazard way. Like We want people to, who are coming in to feel like it was worth their time, right? So this is not like a, it's not a large scale test of a shitty broken thing, right? It's a large scale test yeah. of what we think is a very, very good thing. It's an experiential test, not a bug hunt, right? Yes, yeah. And so the reason we decided to do uh, basically around, around this time is because we had this this question and this lingering question from the original game, which is that around the end of the first act in the original, around the end of the Savannah, uh, we see this kind of drop off in, in players where only only the, like, the most intense people are kind of left um, by the time that first act wraps up. And a big part of it is in the original game because there's not a lot of we didn't have a lot of the discovery mechanisms and all that other stuff, then the loop becomes kind of apparent, right? You build the next station, build the next armor, build the next weapon. And it's also uh, just all kind of more on rails and more linear. You know, there's like kind yeah. of, there's kind of an obvious next thing to do all the time. And like, yeah. Yeah. Well, and as kind of a, a final like thing that kind of turns the game into a little bit more of a single experience is that because of the interaction system in the first game, where you just like click on something on one thing, and then, like, you do One an action, happens. right? Yeah. Um, that also was a very constraining kind of thing because, for example, we had, like, several different kinds of weapon, right? But ultimately, you just click on the target and then your character runs up and, and just starts auto-attacking it in, like, single target mm-hmm. hits, right? And so even even the idea of, like, choosing which kind of weapon you're going to use doesn't really feel any different and doesn't have that many, like, ways for you to play reactively or, like, dramatically change the feel of the game, right? It's just like a, a, a game of numbers at that point. And so that kind of stuff where, like, if we, if we let's say, like, in, in Act 2 of the first game, if we introduced a new kind of weapon... It wouldn't really Well, matter. it wouldn't, wouldn't really <laughs> matter that much, right? And so... Crash and two, you know, our goal was to is to get away from that where where new things that you come across actually like they're meaningfully new. change yeah, they're new. what it is yeah. that you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So basically, what we wanted to see then was with this play test uh, before we essentially say, okay, we know what we're doing as far as like the long form chunk of the game. We've done a lot of testing on the first two or three hours, like that first time user experience, which got very sharp. Um, but then the question still remained, like, okay, yeah, you did all these design things, you've done all this work. Like we didn't have to retrofit how the whole studio operates and all this stuff, right? Um, but we did because we thought that we could hit something higher in the long tail of the gameplay experience, which is something post those, you know, first five, six hours or something like that. Um, and so the question was, okay, we have the whole first zone now, which actually goes up to like somewhere between 15 and 20-ish hours or something like that, it seems like. So does it work actually? Because that's essentially asking a question, is it worth building the rest of the game like this? Or do we need to fucking not, you know? Are we yeah, or even it? just like, what are the, you know, what are the possible pitfalls that we ran into when we were conceiving of mm-hmm. the first act so we can try to avoid repeating those same mistakes in the second act, you know, once yeah. we fix those so things. It ends right? up being kind of like, it's a test and then a postmortem, if that makes sense. Right, where the goal is to understand more about what you've already made so that you can fix any issues with it and then make the next thing uh, better, right? So that it continues to be good. So that was kind of the frame out for the why for the test. Yeah. Um, and we needed, because in the 
to get it, we needed a lot of eyeballs, right? Because mm-hmm. we're talking about experiential stuff and what you just over time when you're, when you're the one doing the stuff or if it's just, even if it's a somebody outside of the work, but who's repeatedly your tester or something, you know, the outcome is always the same, which is that over time people get so used to everything in the game that mm-hmm. they can't really meaningfully comment on what, in a way that is going to be reflective of actual player experiences once something goes live. Uh, but also just a single experience isn't very informative either, right? Because you, you know what that person was mm-hmm. into or not into, but you don't really know what people are into or not into. Right. So, so that was that yeah. final bit of it. We needed enough people that it was it's still an easy test to manage that so we still reduce the chances of things leaking, you know? Um, mm-hmm. uh, but that also we had enough that we could get a nice diverse collection of feedback. Yeah. So we actually then, uh, Adam put together a little, a little survey. We dropped it in the Discord. Uh, got more than 100 responses, I think, just in the first like hour or two. And yeah. first, yeah, we got, I closed it after about like 36 hours and we had 110 yeah. applicants. So uh, it was, if you missed it, it's, I mean, it's perfectly reasonable because it only existed for a very brief time in a very yeah. particular place. We didn't really spread it around. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so then from the applicant pool, we selected 40 people with a spread of essentially experience with either Crashlands or with the crafting genre completely. And the idea here was that we don't just want to select only like the most hardcore Crashlands fans, right? But we do want to select- We don't need our ego stroked. Exactly. Right? We, we need to know what Does it the work? population in general- feels about this game yep. yeah and so good or bad but we also want to know what what crashlands players think of it because that's going to be still our core audience for the yeah. next crashlands game is those who are into og crashlands and if they for some reason hate something we changed then you know it's good to know good to know ahead of time yeah so uh with all that then in place started the test and uh managed to get telemetry into the game ahead of time which then um, Adam and Seth put together and was essentially structures that we could really just see the order in which people were doing a thing, right? So every individual player had a unique ID and we could then essentially, you could almost like walk through, we call them a player trace, where you can walk through all of the major events that happen. So uh, at this time, this quest is completed. At this time, this insight's completed. Here's the first time they got this item, et cetera. Um, so we got that kind of data. We got a few of these kind of big summary pieces of data as far as playtime, sessions, loadouts across playtime, like all the stuff that we wanted to be able to answer the questions where like, have we made some stuff that we just didn't need to make or that people aren't using and we need to go retouch? Uh, are people flowing through the game in the way that we think they are? Or is are there some hiccups? Is there any place where if you look at like a playtime graph, there's just a cliff and like people are not making it past. Like there's a filter point, right? Um, all those things. Yeah. Well, this through. is also the advantage of having data combined with experiential descriptions of stuff, right? Is that mm-hmm. the data can help you find stuff that it basically helps you find holes, right? Because players will comment on the stuff that they experienced, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but they won't comment on the stuff that they didn't experience, Definitely right, and so if there are things that like almost no players did or no players did, you want to know that because that means you didn't get feedback on it, or that the feedback is that that thing sucked and nobody wanted to participate. In whatever right, it was, right? right. Uh, e- either way, it's it's this combo that's really useful because the problem with pure data is that you have to know exactly what all of your questions are ahead of, ahead time. of time, so that you can yeah. get so you can design it to get the right data to help you answer those questions. But you don't know what questions to ask. That's the whole fucking point, right, of, of an experiential mm-hmm. test and, and testing design is you just need actual real human feedback. Um, and so we needed to we needed to make it so we could get both of those things uh, at the same time, but in a way that we could kind of connect together if we yeah. needed to. Yeah. So all that then paired with an exit survey as people left, which hit kind of some of those higher level questions. And then we, kind of, we were able to essentially tether all the data together so we could see, okay, yeah, so this person who we selected because they say – like the, the Crashlands players originally, um, how did they enjoy the game versus, say, someone who doesn't never plays crafting games? Like, it's just not their speed, right? Um, make sure that things are hitting or like or being able to see, okay, if all these players uh, are, are getting to this certain point in playtime and then this is maybe not moving that far forward, is there a clear reason in the data for it if we didn't get like a feedback report about it, et cetera? So it was that kind of big ball of stuff and we started it on a, a Thursday around noon and then ended it on a Tuesday around noon. So it's about five days. Um, and huge shout out to all our playtesters because in that time, 
They played for 14 days yeah. of playtime. Yeah. So it was we, like, 30, we got data from 39 yeah. people, right? Yeah. Who over a weekend basically <laughs> put in 14 days of playtime. Yeah. And the <laughs> max was 26 hours. Yeah. Or 28, even something like that was. I think at the time we concluded the play test, it was 26, but then he uh, kept his game running as long as he could uh, to added do some a stuff. Couple hours to it. Yeah. Added a couple more hours afterwards and then and then shut it. <laughs> so. Yeah. So huge, serious thanks to and, and shout out to all of them for putting the game through its paces. We got tons of fantastic feedback from them. Um, the vast majority of which was these uh, just like little, essentially little feedback tweaks and stuff like that, which is great. That's exactly where we want it to be. Uh, but a few of them are those. I wouldn't say they're they're not huge ones in the sense that it's none of them were were systemic. We didn't have to rethink like, the game or anything. Like exactly. That. Yeah. But we did have a few that were uh, what we kind of refer to as or what I what I like to refer, refer to at least is as entanglements, which is they're things that are small, kind of almost like quality, but appear to be like a quality of life issue, right? Let's say like getting through a menu is kind of confusing or something. Um, but the mere presence of it causes essentially, it's like referred pain, right? Where it's like the pain you're experiencing is actually in this part of your body, but you feel it the as if it's somewhere else, somewhere else right? Yeah. And uh, these like entanglements do this thing where because they're kind of invisible then, uh, they're harder to track down unless you have, again, time's point, that experiential stuff plus the uh, data side of things where you can start asking some questions about things. And one of my favorites was the move speed problem, which we've talked about stuff that players will pick up on and and complain about how you can't trust player feedback, right? Because typically, again, it's entangled with a bunch of other things that might have been happening. Well, I, I would say it's that it's that player players give you feedback about their emotions, their emotional state, how they felt when things were happening. Yes. And yeah. those emotions are valid. Yeah, you trust the not, feedback, you don't trust the 100%. explanation. Yeah, because yeah, the, the player can't, they they just they they feel a thing and then they based on their current understanding of what they've seen right they, they try something. to they try to map it on and rationalize it and oftentimes um, they'll either speak very generally like this game system is too hard mm-hmm. you know or they'll speak very specifically about a very you know like a certain number you know they'll be like right. this this weapon needs to hit this much harder or something like that. And and both of those uh, might be the answer, but there might be something else. Yeah, right? they very well may just be clues, right? And so yeah, there's this clue that we've had really since we, when we started building the game, which is that in almost every playtest, at some point, someone's like character feels slow, mm-hmm. right? but not it's never happens at first. Yep. Like it usually happens at some point during the playtest, people will suddenly start thinking my character moves too slow, right? Right. <laughs> Uh, and what's interesting about this is that we've the character we have sped up the character over time, and this is one of those things where once you once you see when you respond to feedback a few times and it's uh, it doesn't seem to ever be enough. In this case, a very like a really easy example with this character speed is like if you increase the character speed, and then the next play test you get the same feedback. Okay, increase the speed some more. The next play test you get the same feedback, and you're like, okay, this character's now moving ten percent faster. This than character's before. moving pretty dang fast, actually. Yeah, like, and actually, on actually, paper, fa- yeah, fast. <laughs> yeah, on paper, but yeah, exp- that's that whole thing where it's like experientially versus yeah versus reality, right? Or yeah. just, so I think they're just as of our last thing. yeah as of our last series of. Uh, play tests with kind of like newcomers or the ones we were doing one-on-one we had while we had gotten the feedback we've been like that is that cannot be the thing that is the problem doesn't make any sense for it to be the thing that's problem because of these speed increases so yeah and like we know that it is a problem sort of experientially but we can't figure out why it is that people why are they pointing at that as if that is the problem that makes sense because if you think about it like uh the speed at which you move is relative right so if you said like, you know, somebody was driving too fast on the road, right? Well, it's like too fast f- for for what? Like for the speed limit or for the flow of traffic or f- like were they driving dangerously or, yep. you know, uh, or, or, you know. There's what a lot of layered it? questions shoved in there, right? Yeah, because yeah. speed is, is always relative to something else. So if you're, yeah. if you're in a game and you're running around, then you're moving too slow to do what? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And this, and, right. and also to our players' credit, because you know we're talking about how like everybody kind of said this was a problem. We're like, well, this isn't or, this isn't real because like definitionally looking at what's happening, like the player the player character isn't slow, right? But then for my own playtest experience over that same weekend, 
uh, but, but specifically on mobile because I was play testing on Android, which like as far as I could tell, it looks the same. Like there's, it's not moving. It's the slower. Yeah, right? it's the same. Yeah. But something about the the combo of like the resolution and so on, and then and like the aspect ratio of the screen, and then what I decided to do, like how I went through mm-hmm. the game, right. Made it yeah, so that when I was playing, I was like, oh my God, this is actually like, make, this is actually frustrating. Like, I, I was actually frustrated how slow the character, quote unquote, was, right? But really, right. felt is actually the right. accurate. And this is, this is, I think, the fun part because the reason we put on a freeze on it was because we were like, we can't, we cannot, we literally cannot continue speeding up the character. Like, there's, there's It'll a point make at which everything way too easy. Like the combat would be trivial. Yeah, it's one of those. Yeah. It's a crucial piece of of how everything talks to itself, right? And so it's like, okay, we are at a point where we can't actually, we can't realistically make the character go much faster without like the game breaking. Uh, this combat doesn't come up always, or just at the beginning. It comes up in certain contexts, and we just don't quite know what's happening. So we're just going to say, like, you know what? We're not moving the character speed uh, for now, and we're just going to. We'll just wait and see if we can figure out what the deal is. So, comically, uh, after the or during the, during and after the play test, uh, we dug into it again. And I guess Seth, you want to talk about the experience yeah, so, reality here? Yeah. Because- so after going back through and looking at people's commentary about character speed, we found there was kind of a pattern of of points in time at which people would start to feel like their character was slow, and that was whenever they had to do something where they had to move north to south or south to north a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, for example, we had a, a tester a, a while back who had died in this specific place that was far above their their level, like kind of outside where they probably should have been. But that's okay. Like, it's a game about exploring. You should be able to go there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but she died uh, there, and the teleporter that was closest was just straight south of that location. So whenever she went back to get her body, she would go to the teleporter and then run north for a little while, get to her body, but then she died again, right? And then teleported Repeat. run north again right and that was the point where where it's where she was like this character moves way too slow yeah and for right. for me it was when i was in the very beginning of the game which i think actually everybody has seen because it's in in mm-hmm. uh yeah it's some playthroughs we put out but the very beginning of the game you crash land you walk over to this building you've destroyed and then you go north just not mm-hmm. very far you go north a bit because that's where juice box you is, go north right? for like four seconds yep. and, then, right. and then you get juice box out of there and then you come back or then, and then you talk to a character and then you come back south right and then you go back north again to go get There's a bunch box, of north south, back south right? and right. they're all really short but if you kind of if you go in there and you're trying to like you're trying to really quickly do all of those parts of that quest really fast right and I think I think part of why I was on because I had just finished play testing a bit on Steam deck where I started a new game and I played for like five hours then i booted it up on my phone i started over right and so i was more streamlined this time in terms of like yeah so you knew so what you're doing i knew what i was doing so i ended up doing this whole like little north south jog way more back to back and you know uh, but also yeah. it was stuff that i'd already done before so like i just need i was just trying to get it done you know and that combo of things it was the same deal okay i'm just like running north and south running north and south and i just got agitated at some point where i was like why is why does this feel so slow yeah mm-hmm. But it was the same really deal. Like, it was just the north like, and south run. Yeah, and the next thing you you do at that point generally is you start doing some stuff traveling east to west. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. which that feels fine. Yep. Now the reason and it's so, important is because it might not seem like there should be a difference in the player's speed in different cardinal directions. And yeah. you're, you're right; there shouldn't be a sense that there's a difference in player speed. But we're on an isometric projection, which means yeah. you take like a rectangle or a square grid, and you basically turn it 90 degrees, so it's diamond, and then you squoosh it, squoosh it a bit. So it's longer on the wide. Yeah, like it's, on the, it's on wider the, than it is tall. Yeah, wider yeah. than it is tall by some particular but Pretty degree. Pretty good amount. And practically yeah, so what that means, it's the same, same thing if you had a camera that you're holding up and kind of pointed down at the ground 45 degrees, right? Mm-hmm. Where if you're then asking like how many pixels in the camera's view – you know, going north and south correspond to how many inches on the ground, right? Mm-hmm. And it basically means it's it's stretched out that there's a larger distance north and south portrayed by a smaller number of pixels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or an easy an easy example is like uh, if if let's say you're just like looking at a camera or like you're looking at a view off like looking down a street that's going off into the horizon, right? And and a man runs left to right across the across the view. Yeah, right? super fast. Right, and yeah, and you're like, wow, that was fast. And then that same man running at the same speed away instead now just runs directly away from you, right? And you're like, wow, that's so like moving real slow. Yeah. <laughs> instead, uh, they right? just slowly disappear. But we don't actually because yeah. the camera's moving with you though, so nothing slowly disappears in crash lands, right? So 
mm-hmm. you don't even have the sense of like because something is moving away, it's like smaller or whatever, yeah. right? Because uh, yeah. the camera's locked on you. Yeah. So here's yeah. here's where all the sleuthing goes then, which is which is Seth digging in and being like, how slow is the player going? Like you know, technically, as yeah. you travel pixel by pixel, out. yeah. So in, yeah, in some questions to the the grid, the ratio of the the perspective is about fifty seven percent. So that means like. Uh, when you're moving up and down, then pixel by pixel, you're moving 57% of the, of the pixels that you would mm-hmm. be moving left to right. However, the game grid is set up so that you're still moving past all the things in the world at the same rate, right? Yeah. So like if you had like – if you ran past like three trees left to right and it takes you two seconds and then you run past three trees mm-hmm. south to north, it would also take you that same amount of – Time. Yeah, we went for right. we were we went for hard truth, right? Which is like a, the 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 precise truth of how quickly you move in like the real space. Yeah, for the place. for the simulation of the world, right? Yeah, yeah. And exactly. in the, the simulation, is, you move the same in all directions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the problem is it just doesn't feel like it should be like that. Yeah, it yeah. should. I mean, re- like re- realistically, you know. And if it was a three D game, it actually would, right? It would work like that yeah. because. They don't do that in three D games, but yeah. uh, but because of the perspective, because of all these other things, it just it just felt slow when you moved from north to south. Yeah, instead of so instead just, of going the same speed and feeling the same, it was you're going the same speed, but it literally just feels like you're going half as fast. Like yes, just, yeah. yeah. But there's a weird balance because then we did a test where it's like, all right, what if we just completely turn off this this sort of perspective squishing of your movement speed and just let you move at the same pixel speed in all directions? Yeah. Well, suddenly you do that, and now you're moving north south at like nearly twice the speed relative to other things, and it feels like you're a fucking jet engine. But right? only so going like, north and south, like it feels different. Because the thing is, we're trying to the effect we're trying to get is we want it to feel the same to you. When you're moving left, right versus up and down, we want it to feel. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was the cool, th- the, the weird thing, though, right? Was like, well, if we just literally do that, it doesn't feel the same, right? If we yep. like literally make them the same speed, it then does. It they like don't feel like they're the same fast. speed. Yeah, it feels like north yeah. south is really fast. Yeah, because you know, on paper, it, it is way way faster. So yeah. we had to find this kind of weird middle ground where it's like something like we needed like a fifteen to twenty percent speed boost when you're moving vertically. Uh, in order to make it feel like you're moving the same speed as you are moving horizontally, and it was weird because like because Seth was showing different like numbers that he would try to to get a sense of it, like and it was it was just so weird because I remember when I was playing it and I would every time I would go north south, like I would just feel it just felt like I was moving a lot slower than left right, you know. And then when he showed like that one of those little tweaks, this like fifteen ish percent, mm-hmm. right. And as he's like running around in circles to kind of show what it looks like in the different dimensions, I was like, yeah, that's like, that just it feels like you're running the same correct. speed in every direction. Yep. It looks exactly yeah. what I want it to look but like. Not, right? But it's yeah. not. But it's not. What's so weird about this too is that like none of the feedback we got was, hey, I'm too slow moving north and south. Even though you can, you could, I mean, if you're watching or playing it, you could just see it and you could feel it really hard. But like, yep the precision of the feedback is not there. And this is what I mean as far as these entanglements, right? Where it's like the feedback you're getting is either about about the about an aspect of the thing, but blurry enough that you can't actually realistically use it, or it ends up spilling into other systems. So someone may not say like, oh, the the you know the speed of the character is too slow, but they might say something like, you know, I died a bunch of times in this particular place and it was like really annoying trying to get my body back. Um, which could be that's one of those things where you're like, you're like are you yeah, but then it's like well they might have died thing? Yeah, they might have died a bunch of times in other places and never mentioned it being annoying, yes. right? And then so suddenly this is that it's missing like, data problem again, right? Exactly. So yeah. being able and to so, ask those follow up questions was was a huge part of the, the puzzle for us, and um, the place. But it was still that job. realization, right? Because because then Seth had that realization where at some point he was like, "Yeah," because because he knows more about. I mean, he knows how the game works, like literally how it works, right? But he also still had to make that connection of being like, because when we were, because we were in the middle of like debating and trying to figure out what, why this is recurring. Exactly. And, and in my case, it was because I had directly experienced it. So I was trying to like figure out how to, because I also didn't know why. And I didn't notice at the time that it was a north, north, south, south versus south, east, yep. west thing. And so it wasn't until Seth at some point somehow made the connection. He was like, wait a second, is mm-hmm. this, is this it? And then I, I popped up my phone to try it. And I was like, oh yeah, like that's. Yeah, now I, was that like, I know actually, that. I feel fine running <laughs> east to west, even yeah. without like any any of the speed boosting trinkets or anything. Yeah, I felt just, totally fine. Just fine. Yeah, but yeah. this north south. But my sense of the speed just purely came from this north south thing because I because I hadn't made the connection that actually because I only noticed when I was when I didn't like it, mm-hmm. right? And I didn't Which make the connection that to, that was while I was going north and south. It was just yeah. like, <laughs> just every once in a while because it kind of it's like with anything, right? Because all these things are relative to everything else that's going on. 
right? Then I just kind of assume that like sometimes the slow speed is fine because I'm doing stuff or whatever. So like, so I, but I didn't make that final connection of like what actually is happening when it feels yeah, fine versus yeah. when it doesn't. But even if I really had consciously tried to do that, I would have had to realize that north south versus east west is a possible explanation, right? Yeah, it's an insane thing to say that you could. It's just know, a hard you know I mean? thing to guess. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and, Why and, would and, you move slower going north? Yeah, and, and south the fact is that that's how the game has worked the whole time, right? Mm-hmm. And we've had this complaint repeatedly. And it wasn't until this final time that also Seth made the connection, right? So, which is which is all to because underline again, the whole point of all of this, which is it's fucking hard to convert feedback into the actual appropriate change to the game because yeah. diagnosing the real cause of the experiential effect is even for the people who built the fucking game, right? Mm-hmm. And know how literally all of it works. Even when you have yeah. 40 play testers, right? Yeah. Live st- live blogging basically their experiences on Discord, so you just mm-hmm. see everything. Which was right? amazing, by the way. It yeah. was great, and fuck <laughs> loads of data. We had we had nearly four hundred thousand telemetry events recorded, right? Mm-hmm. To like to be able to kind of try to piece together what's going on in the game, and with all of that, we still got frankly lucky that in the middle of that mm-hmm. conversation, Seth Seth we kind of did the connection, out. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it could have just easily not made the connection, and then we just would have been back where we were. Been like, well, because well, we haven't made that connection so far. Exactly. Why would we this time? Right. Yeah. <laughs> get the same feedback. Yeah, for but again, that's that. That's that. If you get like you get this feedback of it, actually reminds me a lot of in the first Crashlands, the feedback we would get the most was the game is too grindy. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yep. yep, we did stuff like we we like just cut crafting costs by like forty percent, I think, in one patch, yeah. and people were like, "This is too grindy." And so we started really thinking through, like, what does that mean? Yep. What does it mean to grind in a game? Because we also were com- comparing that to the thing that players talk about the most, which is the gong weapon, mm-hmm. which requires you to fish up thousands of fish in order to get it. And people love that thing. Mm-hmm. So we're like, how is it, it that people are hyped? Than that. Yeah, how is it that people are hyped about the, the grindiest thing in the game, but then complain about how grindy the rest of the game is? Mm-hmm. And it's because that word means it's a very it's a loaded term. It means it right? means they're bored is what it actually means. Yeah. Right? Grinding means I only have essentially one path to take. And the game is requiring me to take that path, and there's a big time investment to get through that path. Yep. As soon as you choose your own path, mm-hmm. like getting this legendary weapon that you don't have to do, then the amount of investments you're taking to get there is just, you know, that's just you earning your reward that you wanted yeah. to get. But also right? how that works is was different too, because right? there's that. But also when you're fishing, you just get random stuff. It's luck based. It, but it's not, it's not only luck based for the thing you're looking for, but you also just get surprised constantly, right? You're that's just – Every little fishing event is a, its own little surprise with a bunch of random things uh, and its own little mini skill challenge that's just kind of like – it's just kind of fun, right? So, yeah, you have to do it hundreds of times to make it likely you get the mega gong, right? But each time you do it, you're playing a little mini game and you're having surprises. But if you're trying to go harvest a hundred log Logs. trees or whatever, mm-hmm. right? There's no mini game involved. You're just packing trees. There's no surprises. It's just you just get lumber and yeah. related things. You should well, but the, and there are, there are ways. So like for example, in the case of the the fishing stuff, people knew they needed to just catch. As, they just need to fish as much as they could to get that one in a thousand or whatever chance to get mm-hmm. these these rare items. And so people would just come up with ways to maximize the number of fish that they would get. Yeah. So they would like create fish farms. And there's now these, a like, meta game to, that you get to create for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to something like the like like if you're talking about just chopping log trees, right? You know, you can do the farming and the the gardening and stuff like that. Yep. Um, but at the same time, like you're you're doing that in large part because of you just you need those logs in order to progress to the next part of the game, yep. right? Yeah. And so so you can't just ignore the trees. Uh, you, you you have to engage with them, and you need a certain number of logs, and that's where that kind of grindy feeling comes in. And so. Um, that's, that's something that we were kind of like keyed in on as well for Crash 2 because we wanted to make Crash 2 more of a, a choice-based thing where once you get past the very first couple of things, then you have lots of options of what to craft and what not to craft or which quests to do and which ones not to do. And we even had somebody uh, get through the entire first zone 
in what, like four hours? Six hours. Six Somehow hours. Somehow managed to kill the final boss. The Got through it, season. killed the final boss, did it with like the lowest level equipment possible because basically just skipped most things and but didn't really my, craft anything. Here's my favorite <laughs> feedback about that though because he was like, it seemed like the boss had a lot more health. Yeah, too, they like, should. It was too hard, basically. Was yeah, I was like, you're like a naked person hitting them with <laughs> yeah. a rock. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, of it's, course. It's the Zelda equivalent of like just running straight to whatever the fuck. I was impressed. I didn't know you could do yeah. that. Yeah, I was very yeah. impressed. Yeah, and it's so like he still did a lot of stuff on the way, but skipped most of the crafting and progression of like mm-hmm. your character power. Um, and so, but you know, he had a great time, did the things that he wanted to do mm-hmm. and yeah, like sure. The game balance kind of maybe gets weird at some points when you do that. Yeah. But, and meanwhile, um, I played for five hours and like accomplished nothing, like just <laughs> absolutely nothing. Yeah, Cause you're just exploring, you're just building yeah, everything. Cause I play yeah. as a completionist and, and as an ADHD ear, right? So, which is a, which Crashlands 2 is a really good for that combo of, Cause like, Ooh, piece of candy. Yeah. You just, there's always <laughs> another thing to go grab, you know? Uh, and it's all interesting to, to watch and you just get distracted so easily while you're doing stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then the other, the other kind of big thing I think that came out of the play test, um, was, was rec- kind of recognizing the need that we have for, uh, for developer tooling, for allowing us to more easily do internal playthroughs mm-hmm. as the game gets really big. Um, even like at this point where the first act of the game is like nearing completion. Um, well, if that first act, it's so like when, when I was doing my playthrough before we did the actual play test to kind of like just do a spot check, you know, I put in five and a half or six hours and over the, over the weekend and I was only like halfway through mm-hmm. the, the first zone. So then I, and, I said, again, you knew what you were doing. <laughs> I knew what I was doing. Yeah. So I wasn't taking time to like read everything and explore. Like I was still like doing some exploring, but I, you know, I was just going, moving through it. Um, and so then after like five or six hours, I, I handed my save off to Sam, mm-hmm. who then put in another seven or whatever hours um, to get through the latter half of the zone. And he also didn't do every single thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like he just did most of the, most of the stuff. Um, and with that, we kind of realized like, why, well, why did we need to do that? Well, we needed to do that because we haven't just had the time to just sit down and do a full playthrough because yeah. it takes a long time. Yeah. But you also like, it's <laughs> right? also the sort of thing that you really need to do, right? Because those – that, that's the what play the player's going to experience. Yeah, the playthrough you right? did and the playthrough I did, we made, I mean, I had a hundred notes coming out of my seven hours of play, right? And they're all tweaks. None of them were like major things, but they're they're not small in the sense of the issues we're talking about. Again, with all this entanglement stuff, it's like if you get some weird, like an accidental thing that you put out of order or an ingredient that is in a thing that shouldn't probably actually be there or whatever, you can create these really frustrating points, right? Where a player's trying to do something and they can't, they just can't, or it's like, I get grindy as fuck to try to do so. Or there's a mechanic that like hasn't been thoroughly tested in the real context. It might've been tested in like a, in a, in a simple way. And a good example of that is special drops based on quests. So we have a quest where you go and like fish up something or get something by killing some creatures and it just drops during that quest, right? This particular thing. And, and only one of them will drop. Yeah, only one of them will drop. So as soon as the game is like, oh, I already dropped it, it's over there, it doesn't drop another one. The problem I had was apparently mine dropped somewhere behind a thing. Yeah. So I couldn't fucking see it. You didn't notice. I didn't notice. You can't, and you can't see it. I couldn't find it. And so I couldn't complete the quest, <laughs> right? And so it's one of those things where like you want to catch all those, and they're kind of like these like dumb problems, right? Where it's like mechanically it does work technically, but there's a second follow-up issue as far as like potentially you know losing out on the ability to complete a quest like that if you can't fucking see an item thrown behind something and so there's all these things you gotta then like oh okay let's you know put these little shims in here or whatever else or fix up the design that if you like yeah if you're if you're like doing game direction stuff and you're not regularly playing through the whole thing then like you're not you're just missing so much stuff yeah, you know but playing through know. the whole thing is just so fucking costly it takes so yeah. much time yeah yeah, and of course you're also like taking tons of notes the whole time and blah blah. Yeah, so basically what we ended up doing after the play test is we we had sort of a, a priority list of like, okay, what do we need to do, or what kind of tools do we need, and what changes do we need to make to the game uh, so that we can uh, build out the next chunk and address these problems with players. And this play test problem is just a really big one that being able to jump into a spot in the game and play through it like a player very hard. So, mm-hmm. so we put together um, this past week a save snapshotting system where essentially as you're playing through the game, at any point, you can just create a snapshot of your current progress. And that snapshot uh, gets uploaded to our server 
And this is a dev tool only, right? Um, it gets uploaded to our server and then other developers and QA can use that snapshot as a starting point to start a playthrough. Mm -hmm. Um, and so essentially it's like a, it's like a brand, like a git branching basically. Like they can like fork off of your, of your, uh, your snapshot and they can just start playing and they'll have, you know, whatever quests done, whatever base you built, all your equipment, all that stuff. Uh, and so that this will allow us to do stuff like if we have a, a certain area of the game, that's maybe like a sort of like a dungeony kind of, kind of puzzle thing that has lots and lots of quests and various things in it that make for this big cohesive experience. Well, running through that thing does require a bunch of setup. Like you have to yeah. be at the right level. You have to have the right uh, equipment. You have to have the right quests completed so that you can access that space and going through all the developer tools and trying to manually find all those things that you need to set up each time you run through that chunk of the game is just so costly and so tedious. Yeah. And also the snapshot yeah. thing. Ineffective because it's error prone, right? Because like you literally are like looking through hundreds of things that you could be toggling on and off or, you know, picking between. Yeah. And this problem's only going to get worse. Yep. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. So there's, there's just this big scalability problem where we just like, as the game gets deeper and longer, uh, our, our capacity to pick up at some point and, and test stuff gets d diminished dramatically. Um, and so, yeah, so we now, as of this week, we have this new save snapshotting system, um, which just lets us pop in somewhere. Like, do that work one time. And then anybody can do that playthrough from that point. Um, well, it's also, it lets it's us cool for a lot of old saves. Yeah. And it's also cool because so much of what QA has to do to be able to test things effectively is basically just like kind of look at the patch notes, figure out kind of what that means they should test and then come into the game and construct an artificial scenario to, mm -hmm. that they that they hope is representative of like what it's actually like to get to that content or get to that experience, whatever it is, right? Um, and the value proposition of just replay, of just like replaying the game to create a more realistic scenario before you get there, there it's way too expensive because that would be like, you know, three to five hours of like play time just to test one thing kind of a deal, right? Like it's not, it's just not feasible, but this allows QA to actually like spend time doing playthroughs, trying to actually reflect what players do now because QA does wild stuff on purpose, right? But trying to reflect like what players are actually doing to represent different kinds of states that players can be in at various points in the game. Uh, and then they can come into the game and basically grab different ones of those snapshots to go test the same thing, but starting from different kinds of realistic scenarios, right? That were actually constructed by playing the game rather than artificially through all the dev tools. Um, yeah. So it's going to be very cool. Uh, it'll be, I think, tricky for QA to figure out like how to really use it as how effectively. Get the most as, yeah, because yeah. like, oh, there's yeah. a lot of ways you can approach it. Um, but it's gonna well, the other, the other kind of challenge is like it takes a snapshot from where you are, right? And so there's a weird problem like from the QA perspective is let's say you're playing and then you encounter a bug, right? But then it's like, well, I already encountered it, you know? And so if I take a snapshot now, it doesn't actually help anybody else yeah. replicate it. It's not really yeah. for I that, need to. Right? I think it's the thing. Yeah. It's like it's very much for – it's very much to, ex to make easier – experiential testing of like a particular quest situation or yeah. to do these kind of playthrough chunks, right? Where it's like, okay, here's, you're in the correct gear. You're at, you're right in front of this location. We've already built up your base in this way. Like all of which makes sense, you know? Um, so now start from there and go to this next point or, or whatever else. Yeah. Cause it, it, and it does help with replication, right? Not necessarily like, cause you're snapshotting at the time the thing happens, but because QA can construct the scenario yeah. where then a tiny number of instructions after you load that scenario up. Yeah. Go play this as opposed to like, go yeah. play this and go to the dev tools. Yeah. Do go choose the options. Yeah. 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 Uh, I do think that the only other one that was uh, really interesting to me was that there's a hitch basically with the fishing, with the fishing system where yeah, again, nobody was happy with fishing. It's so funny. Well, like, people enjoy the games. You know. the, people enjoyed the two kind of mini games approaches, but um, rapidly grew sour on them because essentially I had placed a fish. It's just this like game, this recipe thing. There's an, an economics thing where basically I would used one of the items that you need in order to build another item. Um, and the one that you need happened to get consumed when you were fishing, okay? Yeah. And so you had this problem where you couldn't actually like mentally do the math on how the fuck to get that other item because you technically were using pieces of it while fishing up the pieces, the other pieces that you needed. And so it's yeah, this whole it's like, like, yeah, it's like spending money to make money, which is the most unpleasant way to make money, you know? Yes. Well, the problem is like, it's, 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 it's even weirder than that because to me, that's just what crafting games are, right? It's like get that's stuff true. to yeah. spend it to get other stuff. The yeah. real problem was that, that there was a lack of player agency because, um, 
for convenience, so we have this this bait system where like you craft bait, and if you've got bait, then whenever you're fishing, it you, it'll use your bait, and you'll get more fish. You don't need to like there, you know, there's just no like fancy UI that you have to go into to figure out which baits to use, or like it's just a very straightforward like if you have bait, you'll you'll get more fish. But there are different categories of fish that use different kinds of bait. Again, automatically. Right, like one of them, like each type of bait just gets automatically consumed as you fish. Well, the problem is one of the types of bait required the other type of bait as yeah. an ingredient, and so if you uh, wanted to make yeah. if you wanted to make yeah. bait two and you had bait one, you couldn't fish because bait one would get used up, and yes. then you couldn't. But but bait two required bait one and fish, mm-hmm. right? So you wanted to use bait one to catch the fish to make bait so two. So again, it's one of these things where like <laughs> on, on paper, like because I'd mapped this all in, the, in this progression map thing, right? Where I was like, oh yeah, a lot of the things we do are like this item consumes this previous item, right? A lot of that kind of like rolling up. And I was like, oh, makes perfect sense. We'll just use that here, boom, boom, boom. Um, and then, yeah, it turns out experientially when you happen to try to play through it, it's very fucking annoying. And yeah, so- Yeah, because you're like, I just want to make this, bed, this this other bait, but I fucking, now I can't fish anymore because yep. it keeps using my first bait, yep. you know? Yeah, but uh, you have to fish to make the bait, right? So that was like, yep. the core problem was a catch-22 scenario where- Yes. Yeah. Where you had to fish to get what you wanted, but every time you fished, you lost. You lost. You lost something, lost that you something else that you wanted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. So uh, you know, so, sometimes we don't have the big best ideas. It's hard to see okay. all this stuff. That's why I got to play it's, it. You know, it's, it's very really complicated. Hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So otherwise, I, I also want to talk about a few other kind of pitfalls that we had mm-hmm. to kind of wrap, wrap up the episode. Uh, stuff that we kind of like either knew about but didn't really have an answer for, or we just kind of forgot or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that definitely kicked a few of our, of our testers out. Oh um, yeah. yeah. So one was uh, language. So, so we have started the process of, of developing localization systems in Crash Dance 2. So the game has the ability to swap to other languages and, um, and we can translate the text and all that stuff. Machine but everything, yeah, currently. Yeah. yeah. Um, so everything that's in there is there just for the sake of testing fonts and interfaces and just the ability to display. It's basically, text. this is the difference between internationalization and localization, right? Internationalization is all the efforts you put in to make it possible to localize stuff, which is like dealing with fonts, dealing with how things are going to look, dealing with the pipelines, all that kind of stuff. And then localization is then saying, okay, now what does it literally say? Like, how do we convert mm-hmm. Translate. Yep. the text into other text and just, and show that to people? So yeah, we've done absolutely. the internationalization part and jammed in machine translations uh, so that we have something to look at that's at least going to have words that are very similar to the final words that actually they're real words and stuff. You know, they're real just words. Be, yeah. They're just not good translations, yeah. right? Yeah, and and also they're way out of date because mm-hmm. we did this quite a while back and it was working we're like, all right, we'll let that sit for now. Yep. Uh, yeah. So so we have these out-of-date machine translations that are either like wrong or missing a bunch of stuff and we had forgotten that uh, when we were setting up all this localization stuff, that we did have it set up where the game would would try to de- like detect your system language that you have set in your OS. And if we have that language in the game, then it will set the game to that language. Yep. So we had some people speaking German, you know, and, and whatever else, uh, who when they booted up the game, the game was in their language, but it was incoherent and bad. Mm-hmm. Um and and uh, I some of them asked about it, and we were like, "Oh God, sorry about that." Switch that back to English because uh, those are not real yeah, translations. That so a few other people booted up in those languages, didn't say anything, and then just kind of stopped playing, yeah. right? Because it's like reasonably they were like, "Wow, this is shit." Yeah. Uh, yeah. So- Our bottom two players played like less than thirty minutes, right? And both of them seem to be trying to play in Dutch. Mm-hmm. Was yeah from the, based on the analytics that we had, yeah. Uh, so our uh, best guess so was they were like, "Well, this this is not good. This is the uh, worst. This is the <laughs> worst text I've ever seen in a video game." And then you know, peace right. out. So that was one thing. Another thing, which I'm got, I gotta put I gotta put uh, Game Maker on blast a little bit. Oh, for you this. got it. <laughs> uh, so we did not know this, but just as a little bit of background, if you buy a gaming laptop. You're like, fuck yeah, this gaming laptop has all the LEDs. It basically is a landing strip, which means it's real fast. Something else that makes it fast 
is that it has a GPU. It has an actual graphics dedicated card. video That's card. basically card. what makes it a gaming laptop, right? Because yep. the yeah. alternative, just for people who don't know, is, is an onboard graphics in the CPU, where the CPU is like has some specialized stuff to do graphics work, but it's not as specialized as a GPU, because a GPU is all about parallelization, right? Fuck loads it's of time processors, garbage. right? Yeah. And it has its own RAM. It's got its own RAM and the whole yeah. So CPU yeah. graphics are like bottom of the – it's like you just need to be able to see something kind of a scenario, right? And importantly, it's it's going to interfere with everything, right? Because it's not it's not on a separate track. Yeah. It's not on a separate processor, right? So well, if you're using your CPU, it's, it's bad. Importantly, if you have a laptop with both. So if you have a gaming laptop where there is there is a GPU. Which a gaming laptop always has – like every computer always has both. Yeah, it right? always has both. And yeah. so on most – uh, laptops have default settings for various applications in terms of which one they use, right? Yeah, do we, yeah. So, for example, if you're using Chrome and you're just watching YouTube, you don't need your GPU to be running full blast and like burning a lot through more your battery yep. and yeah, whatever, yeah. right? Well, uh, and it makes sense too, right? Because because a laptop is trying to conserve batteries, one of its sort yes. of primary goals, right? And heat. And yeah, heat. So, yeah, <laughs> so, so part of its goal is to say, well, if we don't use a whole ass device that's on on this thing, then we can reduce both of those things, right? And so it wants to, it's like the, a laptop wants to default everything to just using the onboard CPU. Mm-hmm. Now, here's yeah. the weird thing, which is that you could just set, you could tell the onboard GPU, the fancy one, you'd be like, hey, run my program on you, you know, because we're going to do some cool stuff. We're going to make some explosions. I need you. Okay? Yeah, as an independent yeah. From, what the, from what the laptop is doing, like if the application could be like, hey, you should put me on the GPU because that would be the best user experience, right? Mm-hmm. So it's yeah, weird. But yeah, go ahead. Sam. Yeah, yeah. The Game Maker team decided to default Game Maker games to not use the GPU, and it uses mm-hmm. the CPU instead. Which means that everybody who plays a Game Maker game on a laptop will just have a bad experience mm-hmm. yeah. until they manually but, go into yeah. their little GPU control panel and tell it physically to. Use this other thing, but right. right. But almost but there's nobody a, knows about that, so they're going to yeah. assume that you just have a the, poorly game performing runs like shit game. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and so so the thing is like this this was a, this is a deliberate choice that the game maker team made, and I'm I'm, I'm advocating for them to un, unmake this choice. Yeah. It's because, the worst possible choice. Yeah, because when you when you're compiling your game, like there is a thing that we can do, which we have now done since the playtest, where we can modify the the configuration files. That to compile it, to tell it, hey, compile this game in a way where the game will tell the system to use, use the, the dedicated thing, graphics card. And so going forward, anybody who plays Crashlands 2, um, now that we have this change, if they play it on a laptop, it will be actually using the correct video card and and it will run well. Mm-hmm. And it also but, doesn't stop the player from overriding that, right? Like the player yeah, can still story, yeah. go to those same settings where previously they would have had to go in to make it so it did use the graphics card and just tell it to use the CPU, right? Mm-hmm. Can't, can't they still do yeah. that? Yeah. 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 I think so, but but yeah, so I mean, and you know, like the, the rationale that- But even if they that, can't, the game's going to play like shit if you don't have a graphics card, so- Correct. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> so nobody, so nobody, nobody playing a game on a laptop- would that has a dedicated graphics card would ever want to not use the the graphics card no. there's just there's no scenario because yeah. even on a even on a lower end game uh like maybe you're playing a game that, that seems to be lower end you know um 10 year old game or like maybe you're playing a some mm-hmm. like nuclear throne or like a 2d game that's like well, simpler even graphics. people watch looking it's, at crash lands too where they'll be like well it's not 3d and like all this kind of stuff right but yep. the uh, sheer amount of like drawing to the screen and there is so much shit going on. Yeah. So many visual effects and all that um, to, to make it look the way that it looks. Lots yeah. of shaders, tons of spine animations, all these like tons of textures. And yeah, like as soon as as soon as it's not using the video card, it's just it's just running like crap. Yeah. Uh, and so so that's something that we did not um, anticipate because, again, it, it just kind of like we just couldn't. There's just no reason, no good reason for it to be like this. So yeah. we didn't, we just had no reason to assume that it was like this. Um, so that hit us. And then we also had just one final kind of blunder, which was, which was how we dealt with our steam branches, mm-hmm. which was that we, we invite everybody to the play test. We give, we give them the keys. And then we say, uh, here's this password that you put in, in order to get onto the correct steam branch. Uh, what we had forgotten was that 
six months ago, we had a Steam branch that was used for delivering a, a build to some third party mm-hmm. that did not have a password, which means that if you got access to the game and you didn't like read much into the instructions and you just like went into the, the Steam branches page and popped it open, you would see a branch there that you could switch to. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't put the password in, then that would be the only branch that you saw because you didn't put the password in to get to the, the correct branch. So we did have someone, mm-hmm. possibly more than one person. But I think it was only person. one. Yeah. Uh, who ended up playing you on it. not know if it was more because you wouldn't see him in the yeah. telemetry. Yeah, because so. yeah, their, their data was missing from telemetry. So, and nobody else right. was as far as we can tell. Yeah. And so, so, so we were getting all kinds of feedback from this person where it was, it was very confusing because they were talking about the way that things were behaving in the game that just did not match up at all with Reality. how the game was, works yeah. now. Right. Um, but as they started like giving more feedback, we were like, this sounds. Weird. These sounds like problems like, from at least six These sound ago. like problems that we've already fixed. How are these coming back, right? Mm-hmm. And then, sure enough, we started digging some more. We found like, oh, this person has been playing for hours and there's no telemetry yeah, from was like, them. We went and to go they, check their telemetry the and, there was, and there was zero. There wasn't any, yeah. yeah. And we were like, are they playing offline? And, then, and so we asked and then, yep, sure enough, like they were on a, a build from like May or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and all this stuff we've done since then, all like all these – game systems and optimizations and content and quit like all this like they just didn't get to experience any of it which i feel terrible about because like in my opinion it was our fault that like we fucked that up by by just making it so easy to make that mistake you know it is but it was Um, it was the thing that because nobody else made the mistake which is important because it was easy to make right and the amount Which of props to everybody the for the amount reading. of emphasis yeah. that I put on, and I always put it at the top because I know people don't read stuff. So, like before I did anything else with all the onboarding stuff for the playtest, I was like, I even had the little like warning emoji, you know, where I was like, you will have to do this. And that was before I gave them their keys and stuff, right? Like, uh, here's but, how this works. But you it's know, that constant fucking... reminder, though, that it doesn't matter how. Actually, I think there's actual feedback from the game too, which is like related to this, right? Which is. There were various things we were like, it feels like players aren't quite grokking this because there's like these weird gaps and stuff, right? We're like, we know we told them, right? And we also know they did it once, like we because we can see that in the data. Yeah, you're right? talking about just like just like stuff within the game. Just play, stuff within right? the game, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And but then they but then they end up like being confused about it for a while until they until they kind of like have to confront the thing again rather than but where we were actually expecting them to keep like dealing with that thing. But then what we see in the data was like there'd be like a half hour gap across the board where like people would do a thing for the first time and then they would seemingly not know it exists anymore for another half hour, right? Mm-hmm. And it's the same kind of idea as like when you're running a play test where you're trying to convey lots of information to people where on your side, it all makes total sense, right? Because I'm like, okay, I'm onboarding players onto Steam, right? I have a bunch of things I'm trying to make sure I get solved. There's a whole bunch of information I need to pass on to people who are just unfamiliar with all of mm-hmm. it, Right. And I'm trying to make sure everything they would need to know is in there. But, but that tries, but yeah, but that, but that ends up being a lot because you're trying to address mm-hmm. like all the scenarios that people can find themselves in and blah, blah, blah. But for any given person, they're only going to find themselves in one of those scenarios or, or whatever, right? Yeah. Which means a lot of the instructions are not relevant, which means they're going to skim. Yeah. So people means- skim stuff. Right? <laughs> and, and even when they don't, like even, even when they, if they read it and then like there's a little bit of a gap before they go take an action, yeah. right? Yep. Then because that stuff doesn't mean very much to them because it's all new, then it's as if they didn't read it, right? And like you see that in the – you can see that in various aspects of the playtest because like I put instructions up, you know, um, of exactly what to do. I had like the dates when things were going to end and stuff. I had a pinned, a pinned message that had all that info in it. And every day at least three people asked, what is this thing end? <laughs> what is this thing? Whatever. Uh, because people just aren't – they're not – well, it's, it's too much. Not able too to much keep info. track of all that info, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not even about them just not doing it or being lazy. Or, it's nothing like yeah, that. It's, at no, all. it's no. always fault. It's just yeah. how human brains work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, like, and like I know because I'm the person who posted it. Like I know all the information is in there, right? And it makes it really easy. And there's is a problem you see also for a lot of indie devs when they're like replying to people's feedback and stuff, right? Where they're like, they get mad because they're like. Can't, how come you can't see this, right? Like, why aren't you reading this, et cetera, right? When the reality is, is like things just have to be reinforced and you have to remember that everybody experiencing the stuff that you create or onboarding them onto or whatever is all of the stuff is new. All of it. It's a lot. That's and it's a, a lot. lot. And they can't yeah. differentiate like important versus unimportant, long-term versus short-term, a system versus like a one-off thing, right? Because they, they don't, they have to learn the 
patterns. Like they, people don't learn stuff when it's told to them once. That's just not how anything works, right? They learn stuff by doing it a lot or seeing it a lot. And and that was a, yeah. so that was another takeaway we had, which was so we see it in the play test itself, where it's like we did I, I did everything I could think of to try to make sure that we could have smooth onboarding, and it was honestly very smooth. But it still allowed like one person to slip through the cracks, right? Mm -hmm. And in or games, similar thing, deal, you know, or yeah. the GPU thing, yeah, and so same deal like in in game where we thought we had provided like if you just look at it, it's, it's, it's again the on paper thing, right? If you just look at it on paper. We fucking told people how to do stuff, right? Yep. Like we told them what was important. We told them how. We told them why, right? And reinforced and it, it a couple. Times. And reinforced it. But what we actually see experientially is that so still wasn't enough sometimes for some of those mm -hmm. things, right? And it's easy to fall in that hole where you're like just mad because you're like, why can't people get it? But the reality is, from if, like taking it on your trying to take the more uh, positive perspective on it, right? It's just people can't know it's important, and so mm -hmm. things need to be reinforced. To, across all of these way more than you think yeah. and it's fine yeah i mean overall the play has been just really fantastically and again huge huge thanks to everybody who participated for those couple of days the game's gotten way better it was already good frankly but i mean yeah we got a lot better uh, feedback was all very positive yeah all these little ways and even the negative feedback was positive in the sense that we learned a lot from it yeah <laughs> it was good and the thing I'm most excited about is that the like the overall data we got from it as far as like the shape of both like median playtime, player drop off, that sort of thing, all looks better than the original game did, which of course, you know, that already. Was already. Yeah. In this kind of weird shortened test period and stuff. And so um that all points to very good things for the future for Crash Lands 2, which I'm very excited about because frankly, it's been a lot of work uh, you know, redesigning and re envisioning this whole thing from scratch for the last three years. So I'm glad it, it is it's working. It's nice to see that it's on track. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean we're we're closing out four years of work on it. Right. Is that well this is our third this is three. We're, we're wrapping right. we just wrapped our third year. Because it's 2020, yeah. 2021, 2022. Well no, we started 23. We started in November 2020. It was kind of middle-ish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, three so it was like, like three years, years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So we still got quite a lot left, but now we are coming into this last phase much more confident uh, with what this game is and how it works and how to how to make it be the best it can be. So yes, yeah, so a huge thanks to all the, the playtesters. Uh, and that's all the time we have for this week. There's a lot of other stuff I want to talk about because a lot of things have happened, but uh, I'll have to wait until mm -hmm. next episode. Yeah. We'd like to thank our producers, Fat Bard and Sampa Costa, for putting the podcast together. And thanks to our community moderators who keep our Discord running. To get more involved in the Butterscotch community, you can just go to podcast.bscotch.net, where we have links to the Discord, a way for you to donate, and links to the archives. And as always, if you haven't yet, head on over to Steam, give Crashlands 2 a wish list. Uh, it helps boost the game on the, uh, the Steam algorithms and, of course, helps us quite a lot. So we'd appreciate that. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.